Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first uh, in our series of ESG Focus webinars. So for tonight, ESG, which stands for Environment, Social and Governance, has been gaining more attention recently with escalating concerns over climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in tonight's session, speakers from Nico Asset Management, Wellington Management, and the Sao Family Office and our IFAS research team will be sharing with you about what ESG is, the investment opportunities, as well as why ESG matters to you as an investor. So to kick us off uh, with tonight's presentation, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Cheng Jingyan, IFAS Research Analyst, to present ESG Investing. What, why, and how? Uh, Jingyan, please. So hi, good evening, everyone. And thanks for taking the time today to tune in to tonight's webinar. My name is Jingyan, and I'm an analyst from the Unit Trust Research Team. And I'll be kicking off the webinar with a little introduction to ESG. So if you've been keeping up to the investment news regularly and have been keeping up to date with the latest developments, I'm sure you have noticed the term ESG coming up more and more often. For the uninitiated, ESG investing, also known as sustainable investing, is an investment approach that considers environmental, social and governance sectors alongside traditional considerations in financial factors when it comes to investment decisions. So commonly, when the term ESG is mentioned, most people tend to gravitate towards environmental concerns. I would say this is quite natural, considering how climate change is at the forefront of many discussions globally, whether it has to do with political agendas or freak weather conditions. Like, for example, recently in Singapore, you also noticed that the, the torrential rain and flooding is getting more and more extreme, right? So the E aspect of ESG focuses on the impact and consequences on the environment and considers factors like climate change, emissions, deforestation, and resource depletion. In this space, we do see quite a lot of impact investing, which means investing in to make positive changes, and in this case, negative environmental impact. So in particular, after the COVID-19 pandemic crash in March last year, we saw clean energy stocks, particularly solar energy and wind energy, rebound extremely strongly. And they came up about two, 300% last year. So another common way to invest in the E part of ESG is through exclusions, where investors don't invest in sectors that pollute or contribute significantly to global uh, emissions. So for example, not investing in your traditional energy, your oil and gas sectors. Moving on, the S in ESG, ESG stands for social. So the social criteria considers a company's relationship with its stakeholders, as well as how these stakeholders are treated. So these stakeholders include, but are not exclusive to employees, suppliers, clients, and their communities. In this aspect, many people consider factors such as racial diversification, gender equality, and adherence to workplace health and safety. While certainly not as popular as environmental concern, this aspect has grown significantly over the last year because of the pandemic. Particularly in the fixed income space, there have been so social bonds being issued to um, deal with social issues caused by COVID, such as unemployment and affordability of healthcare. COVID highlighted how fragile our society's fabric is, with concerns such as healthcare access, workplace safety, and affordable housing as well. So this is where issues such as fair labor practices are identified. Certain items like modern slavery and child labor is quite common in agriculture, mining, and clothes manufacturing. So you think about Nike, the Nike sweatshop scandal in the early 2000s are all under this umbrella. Interestingly, this is the one that has had the most growth this year. You would think it's environmental, but it's not. So income redistribution being the key factor and the key impact of investing in social. So we do see a lot of exclusionary screening here as well, where companies avoid, uh, where funds avoid companies that invest in um, that do this kind of unsavory practices. So finally, the G in ESG stands for governance. The governance criteria considers the internal system of practices, controls, and procedures that apply when running a company. Good governance can help align stakeholder interests and help to ensure the long-term sustainability of a company. So some basic principles of good corporate governance include accountability, transparency, fairness, and responsibility. But the team is extremely hard to invest in isolation. Investing in good governance is 
essentially just normal fundamental analysis and investing in a good company. Because good corporate governance, governance is a sign of a good, well-managed company. And these are the kind of companies that you as an investor should be investing in anyway. So the next question, what are the different ESG strategies? No, sorry. This is, um, what are the ESG metrics? So as you can likely tell, ESG is a very subjective and fluid objective. So in order to make a measurable and specific change in this ESG criteria, we have to have a metric to measure things by. So this can be roughly categorized into two types of companies. The first type will be standard setters. So standard setters set goals and targets for companies to meet, where there's quite a large variety of these kind of companies, or this kind of standard, sorry. A common guiding principle that is generally accepted and utilized is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, of which there are 17 key objectives that range from reducing inequality, climate action, and solving global hunger. Other than standard setters, we also have data providers and aggregators. So these organizations collect and provide data related to particular ESG issues. So many of these organizations also double up as rating agencies. They have their own methodology in evaluating how well a company complies with ESG standards. Some examples here include Bloomberg, Reuters, and Sustainalytics, which were acquired by Morningstar in 2020. So what are the key um, different ESG strategies? So ESG strategies fall broadly into the following categories with different levels of ESG incorporation. Starting off from the broad bottom, we have non-ESG rated mm -hmm. funds. And these are the exception in today's world, as most funds already have a basic ESG filter built into them. Minimally, they utilize exclusionary screening, which avoids investing in specific companies and or industries associated with these objectionable or questionable activities. Examples include tobacco, weapon producers, or fossil fuels. So as we highlighted earlier, exclusionary screening is a common way to invest in the environmental and social aspects of ESG. At a higher level, we have positive selection. So these funds invest in companies that we consider best in class or score highly on ESG rating methodologies. And these methodologies could be both internal or external. So they actively select industry leaders for ESG ratings and look to invest in them. And finally, at the top of the chart, we have thematic or impact investing. These funds typically seek to isolate specific ESG issues Consider, considering the breadth of the investment universe, it makes sense to focus on one of two, especially deal with them. Another common practice here will be undertaking an active approach. So when funds invest in specific companies, they are often significant shareholders and they hold a large amount of the company. So this gives them significant voting influence on company policy and direction. So utilizing this influence in the right way could generate a lot of positive impact in the direction a company could take with regards to certain ESG-related decisions. Finally, what un uncommon, it is not unheard of for these funds to target specific non-financial outcomes along with financial returns, such as increasing literacy rates in a specific region or removing a certain amount of greenhouse gases from the environment. So what are the challenges to investing in ESG? So <clears throat> there are some significant obstacles in the space that investors have to be aware of. Firstly, there's a lack of standardization across the board regarding ESG investing. The complexity of the global geopolitical environment, different operating practices across industries, and how broad the entire ESG space can be makes it almost impossible to standardize. <clears throat> For example, holding a tech company to the same standard as an oil and gas company in terms of emissions does not make a lot of sense and comparing a maybe a developed market mega cap company to a tiny a tiny company in a frontier market somewhere also doesn't make much sense. There's also certain aspects of ESG investing that can be quite subjective. So many big tech firms often rank extremely highly on this list because of their low emissions, which is obviously a byproduct of their business model, and innovation, which helps to alleviate social issues through wealth creation and problem solving. However, on the other hand, monopolistic practices, poor security, poor working conditions are all criticisms that have been leveled their way and, it, and not very long ago either in the recent past. And people may have different interpretations of whether these companies generate more good than harm. So how does this affect you as the investor? 
well, you might not agree with some of the fund house decisions when it comes to their asset allocation. So this means that your own ESG investments might not meet your own ESG goals or what you seek to achieve. In addition, this also leads to a lack of comparability across funds. Different ESG metrics across funds means different investment universes and companies that these, com these funds consider investable. And any difference in performance thus could be attributed to that rather than just purely picking the right stocks. So the second key issue that we would like to highlight here is greenwashing. So greenwashing is the process of conveying a false impression or providing misleading information about how environmentally friendly a product is. The rise in popularity of ESG also means that it has become a very attractive marketing tool that can be used to attract unwitting investors. However, we expect this issue to be solved in the near future with many regulators such as the SEC in the US starting to implement laws regarding naming a fund an ESG fund. And this is also happening in Asia as well. <clears throat> in the meantime, investors only have themselves to rely on. So to help investors with that, we would like to share some tips about how to avoid greenwashing. So firstly, investors can use third-party ratings. With many of these data providers and aggregators we mentioned earlier, serving as good unbiased evaluators of a fund's ESG quality. And this can often be found on the fund's fact sheet. So when you're investing in a fund, you most likely already have access or are looking at a fund's fact sheet, so it should be relatively easy to find. One of the other ways to identify commitment is um, Funhouse investing resources into coming up with its own proprietary ESG rating. I think we already mentioned quite a few times that ESG investing is very subjective. So different parties will have different interpretations of events and companies. And just wholesale adopting another party's ratings can appear insincere. So in addition, companies who develop these proprietary ratings are also more likely to apply them to themselves company-wise that result in a holistic approach. Finally, another thing to keep an eye on is that funds that quantify the impact that they have made. So measuring the impact in a quantifiable manner points to them having specific goals that they seek to achieve and a fund house that holds itself accountable to meeting these goals. This can often, often be found in a fund house ESG report as well as fund fact sheets. <coughs> So now that we have gotten the basics out of the way, we should look to answer the most important question of all. Why should you as an investor care about ESG? Well, fundamentally, incorporating ESG decision-making into your investment makes sense. Many of the traits that ESG measures are metrics that good companies measure exhibit as well. And while not all good profitable companies exhibit strong ESG characteristics, companies that do are often good choices for you to invest in. Also, ESG is a long-term mega trend that investors can look at as a tactical play. Many ESG invest team investments have picked up steam in recent times, especially those in the environmental and social sector. And there has been an increasing awareness, especially through the pandemic, that's highlighted a lot of social issues that are very important for most governments to deal with. And so we do not see this investment trend going away anytime soon. And finally, while partaking in a mega trend can help to generate returns, an ESG filter is also an excellent risk management tool. ESG factors help to manage much of the idiosyncratic company-specific risk that can be caused by bad practices. This is especially true in the governance aspect of ESG. When bad practices come to light, it is often reflected in stock prices as fines start to rack up and investors lose confidence. But some companies, such as Nike and Volkswagen, for example, have managed to pick themselves up after really bad scandals. Many others haven't, such as perhaps Enron and the Lehman Brothers. Those are companies that everyone should be well aware of. And because of their poor corporate governance, they don't even exist today anymore. So how do we get how do investors get exposure to ESG? So invest, investors can refer to our website for more research and ideas when it comes to ESG investing through both the ESG hub and the fund ideas segments. And that brings me to the end of my segment. So I'll hang, hand over the time to the Bankton team to continue the sharing. Hope everyone can see it. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle and I'm a portfolio advisor at Wellington Management. Uh, 
uh, as a portfolio advisor, I work at the intersection across portfolio managers and clients as well. So we have close to 1.4 trillion uh, US dollar asset under management now. We started managing money since uh, for clients since 1928, and we are primarily an institutional asset manager with no direct retail businesses. Since we have a private partnership structure and that the only business that we do is as management, uh, we are not as impacted by crisis like COVID, fortunately, because we do not have to answer to any external shareholder boards or any parent companies. Everyone making decisions for our firm works at our firm. We have a long history of sustainable investing. Uh, so our firm's sustainable investing efforts started back in 1970 with our future themes collaboration, including a search for clean water, etc. Wellington have had a dedicated ESG research team since 2011, and we are signatories for various global initiatives, including the UNPRI, in which we are A-plus rated, as well as the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Our sustainable investment head, Wendy Cromwell, has been on the UNPRI board, the board who decided the sustainable development goals uh, mentioned by Jin Yan earlier since 2018. There are only two investment manager representatives sitting on this board, so we're proud that Wendy is one of them. Wellington's partnership with the Woodwell Climate Research Centre, the world's leading independent climate research uh, institute, allows us to bridge the science and finance world on the topic of climate change. For example, our investors can pick a semiconductor stock whose fab is located at a region with the least probability of drought over another semiconductor stock, all else equal, as manufacturing of semiconductors uh, require a significant amount of water. So engagements with these companies' management say on how they treat the wastewater that they created can also be more effective as we're armed with these science data as well. So we believe the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. We aim to identify companies uh, who are solving for some of the world's biggest problems in an innovative way who would be able to not only help build a better world, but also generate attractive profit along the way. Our bottom line is therefore to have double bottom line. Our objective is to both generate better investment return than the broader equities and bonds markets, and to help shape the world into one that we want ourselves and our next generations to live in. Now, the sustainable investment space has evolved over time, and Jing Yan already explained some of the challenges. Now, some investment approaches are concessionary in that it sacrifices some financial returns to achieve social benefits, while some other approaches are not. We at Wellington break the space down into four areas of investing. So the oldest form of sustainable investing was negative screening or socially responsible investing to screen out those so-called irresponsible stocks or sin stocks, uh, for example, you know, tobacco, gaming, alcohol. Such approach have been found to be concessionary, unfortunately. And then another is ESG integration, which was explained earlier, which integrates you know, ESG risk and opportunities into the advanced investment analysis. Such approach is not necessarily concessionary, it depends. And thirdly is sustainable thematic investing, which focus on specific themes like infrastructure, water scarcity, and alternative energies, etc. So if you manage to catch the tailwind and invest at the right timing, not only can these strategies be non-concessionary, it can also generate great return. But if you caught the wrong timing, just like any thematics you invest into, it can go the other way around. Lastly, what we're going to share about today is impact investing. Now, impact investing to us means intentionally investing into companies whose core products and services address some of the world's major societal and environmental challenges. This approach is certainly not concessionary as impact is actually a driver for earnings growth for companies. It touches upon multiple themes, so market timing is also not necessary. And why impact investing then? Now, coming out of COVID, many people, my friends, maybe yourselves, have said that they have gained a whole new perspective of what's really important in life. 
clients are increasingly telling us that they want their investment to not only compound wealth, but also help shape a better world. Many have a preference for an all-in-one solution that invests in the renewed world we want our next generations to live in, whether it's related to life essentials, human empowerment, or the environment. Now, E2020 reaffirmed the benefit of investing across a broad set of impact themes, which is one of the reasons why our funds have done particularly well in 2020. COVID has obviously accelerated the health theme when problems accessing hospitals, testing kids, vaccines, etc., in poorer countries were revealed. Also, cybersecurity's digital divide and online learning as uh, the world relied even more on technology to stay connected during lockdown. But we cannot predict what type of crisis the world may face next. So our diversified approach offers the greatest opportunity for of gaining exposures of companies that can contribute to solutions for whatever lies ahead. The need to step up global efforts to tackle climate change became clear as well. And many countries are linking their economic recovery fiscal plans to the low carbon transition and energy efficiency goals. Then on the private sector, the advancement in science and technology we have today is finally allowing for companies solving the world's biggest social and environmental problems to earn decent profit. For example, there are at the moment about 1.6 billion people worldwide who are unbanked. They do not have a bank account. Yet two thirds of them already have a smartphone. So companies offering low cost solutions um, via their smartphones can help reduce inequalities and at the same time make great profit. Impact investing can also help diversify your overall portfolio because impact companies, as we define it, tend to be quote unquote, off the beaten trail, you know, with differentiated business models, often smaller market capitalization, many are in emerging markets with less sell side coverage. As a result, they tend to be underrepresented in indexes, and therefore can be effective diversifiers. So here we show 11 themes and under three areas where Wellington identified the world's biggest social and environmental challenges lie. On the left-hand side, life essentials, so basic needs that are essential for life, like access to clean water and sanitation, uh, like health, etc. And then in the middle, we invest into tools for human empowerment, like financial inclusions, and to bridge that digital divide. And then right-hand side, we also invest into company, obviously, that help protect the environment. Wellington have 12 investment professionals specializing in the life essentials theme and then 16 for human empowerment, 14 for environment. This allows us to understand the relativity across the different themes so that we can lean into whatever works at different times. So now let's deep dive deeper into, first of all, the impact equities opportunities, uh, which we believe can provide three things. Uh, number one, good investment return potential. Number two, values alignments. Uh, and number three, diversification to your overall portfolio. So why do we expect impact companies to outperform the border equities market? Now, the dark blue bars on this slide represents our impact opportunity set, while the light blue bars represent the MSCI All Country World Index, so the broader equities market. In the top two charts, you can see the historical sales growth of our impact opportunity set almost doubled that of the MSCI All Country World Index on the left-hand side. And then top right, you can see the projected EPS growth of our impact opportunity set is also solidly better. In the bottom charts, you can see that on the left-hand side, there are less sell side coverage for our impact opportunity set. And then on the bottom right, you can see that the spread between winners and losers are wide so that there are more market mispricing that we can capitalize on. The uniqueness of how Wellington approach impact investing is that we see impact as the driver for earnings growth. The way we do it is we first draft out our impact opportunity set, and then the rest is just a process that our portfolio manager follows in all her different portfolios, so it's well tested. To craft our impact opportunity set, we apply three criteria. So first of all, on the left-hand side, material means at least 50% of the company's revenue has to come from the impact theme that they're associated with. So half of the revenue has to be relevant. 
in the middle, additional means they must fulfill unmet needs that cannot be easily met by other agents like the government. And then measurable means the impact they make must be quantifiable and sustainable over time. We have now identified nearly 500 stocks in our impact opportunity set, which is big compared to just 136 names in the uh, MSCI Sustainable Impact Index. Now, to give you an example, the lack of internet access in poorer countries has been a barrier to social inclusion and financial inclusion, as well as human empowerment. Now, such problem can now be solved by, for example, a company we hold under our digital divide theme called Grameen Phone, which is the largest telco service provider in Bangladesh. By fulfilling this unmet need, they are generating 40% free cash flow margin. They are also providing Bangladesh women with jobs selling data in communities that otherwise would not have access to the internet. So Grameen Fong helps address a number of UN sustainable development goals as highlighted on the uh, top left-hand side. Number five, gender equality. Number eight, decent work and economic growth. Number 10, reduced inequalities. And number 11, sustainable cities and communities. So how is their measurable key performance indicator or KPIs doing? Their services are benefiting at the moment 76.5 million individuals in Bangladesh. We are now encouraging them to also measure the economic and social empowerment from internet connectivity so that their impact can be measured and seen. So we understand that clients are increasingly looking for values alignment as well when they invest their money in. Impact equities can also provide that. We report the impact our portfolio holdings have made every year in our Global Impact Annual Report. We have just published our 2020 report and during the year, investments in our impact portfolio have, for example, provided education, training and career access to more than 328 million people, supplied more than 686 a thousand affordable housing units and provided or cleaned more than 142 billion cubic meters of water. Now, so why do I say that um, our fund or investments can help diversify your overall portfolio? Because of our high bar of impact purity, many of our holdings are stocks that are quote unquote off the beaten trail. So as you can see on this top 10 holding slide, even the top 10 holdings, you won't find many familiar names. Now, large companies, mega cap companies, often will have more diverse income source. Therefore, they may not meet our impact uh, purity threshold of at least 50% of the revenue has to be generated from an impact theme. As a result, our portfolio have much higher allocation to small mid cap names. So 47% in companies smaller than 10 billion US dollar in market cap versus just 5% in the benchmark. So can really diversify away other portfolios that are heavily invested in say the FANG stocks. Now, given the world's biggest problems, unfortunately reside in more in poorer countries, our impact opportunity set also has an overweight to emerging markets. So in terms of investment performance, you can see in the top table that we have outperformed the broader equities benchmark in the recent quarter, one year, three year, as well as since inception period. In the bottom table, you can see that we consistently outperformed the MSCI All Country World Index year on year, except 2018 where we're flat. So we really have done this double bottom line. Uh, now let's have a look at the impact bonds opportunity and let me pass over to my colleague, Jeremy Butterworth. Thank you, uh, Michelle, and maybe we'll flick back to slide 22 and uh, I talk, talk a little bit about um, impact investing from uh, a fixed income perspective. And um, I'm also a portfolio advisor at Wellington and, and really specialise uh, in our fixed income capabilities. Um, so if we could just move forward, I think one slide. Uh, one more. Fantastic. Thank you. Michelle. Um, so when we think about, um, you know, fixed income portfolios within this uh, impact framework uh, and philosophy and, and also in, in relation to um, you know, the, the multi-asset strategy that we're uh, managing alongside Nico, um, we're really uh, following a similar philosophy and approach to our impact uh, equity colleagues. And we're using this 
this similar lens uh, and broad categorization of, of, of the opportunity set, life essentials, human empowerment and, and environment, um, but, but also uh, aiming to have the, the lens of uh, additionality, uh, materiality and, and measurability um, in, in ensuring that, that every issuer uh, that we own uh, in the portfolio or as a candidate for the portfolio uh, meets uh, that criteria. And so, you know, again, our, our goal is to, to achieve this double bottom line. Um, so we want to have uh, a measurable and, and positive impact on, on society and the environment um, through our investments um, that we're making on your behalf, uh, but also aim to outperform uh, traditional global fixed income markets. And, you know, we consider uh, this portfolio to be, you know, an excellent ballast uh, in, in this strategy and, and really, um, you know, have similar characteristics uh, to a traditional high quality um, uh, uh, broad fixed income portfolio, global fixed income portfolio uh, that would have similar characteristics as, as the Bloomberg uh, Barclays Global Aggregate. And so, you know, with that, um, you know, when I think about the opportunity set on, on, on slide uh, 25, um, again, we have um, this, this view of, of looking uh, through these 11 different themes um, under these three categories, uh, life essentials, human empowerment, and the environment. And all of these 11 themes are really a great starting point to identify um, impact companies, impact issuers, and, and projects. And, you know, we also aim to have the majority of the proceeds uh, from the issue uh, of bonds, bonds funding these projects uh, to be aligned with products, services, or projects uh, that, that align with these 11 impact themes. Uh, and, and, you know, also, uh, you know, uh, Jin Yang mentioned the UN SDGs um, and, and both our, our impact equity portfolio and our impact fund portfolio um, can be correlated back uh, to some of these, you know, the 17 uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you know, we, we often see these um, really as, as a clear indication of uh, the impact we're making on, on society and, and the world. So, you know, first I thought I would just take a slightly deeper dive into the opportunity set for fixed income. And so if we uh, move forward again, uh, one more slide, um, uh, we can see uh, what the universe looks like. And really the, the key takeaway from this is when we think about fixed income investing, um, there's a lot of things we can do uh, beyond just investing in public equities. Uh, and so the, the bond market actually offers uh, even greater breadth than public equity markets for impact investing. Um, and this is because there are a number of areas uh, outside um, of, of traditional um, equity markets, like local municipalities, uh, like governments, uh, like supranationals or government agencies, as well as the securitized debt space. And so now, as you can see on the chart in front of you, you know, roughly one third of, of the, the universe is, is traditional corporate bonds, which will be correlated with, with traditional um, public equity markets. Uh, and so there's this huge opportunity set uh, that really sits outside of, of, of the traditional corporate bond market. Um, and this could be providing, you know, funding in, in areas um, like increasing educational funding uh, to improve local schools uh, through municipalities. Um, and, and this could be in underprivileged areas. Um, this could be providing uh, affordable housing through um, funding uh, developers in, in higher socioeconomic neighbourhoods uh, that are providing multifamily homes uh, to a lower income earners. Um, so, so the opportunity set is, is extremely wide and, and really the, the, the key takeaway from here is, um, you know, today this opportunity set sits at over a trillion dollars. Um, and, and often when people think about impact investing, um, especially in the fixed income side, they think about green bonds. And when we think about impact investing from a fixed income investor's perspective, we don't limit ourselves to just looking at green bonds alone. Um, we use this, this lens and, and this criteria or framework of uh, materiality, additionality and measurability. And as such, we've been able to build a, a much wider universe. And, and what we do is we leverage um, the, the insights of our, of our equity investors uh, as well as our, our fixed income research analysts. Um, and, and what this has allowed us to do is identify not only impact opportunities in green bonds, uh, but also uncover 
uh, unlabeled impact opportunities. Uh, and so, you know, today, as, as I mentioned before, you know, the universe sits at over a, a trillion dollars. And so we feel very comfortable uh, in our ability to, to meet that double bottom line. So be able to, to make a positive impact on society, as well as achieving above market returns uh, for the level of risk across uh, the different fixed income sectors. So, you know, often the, the next question that, that comes up is, Jeremy, you know, how do we measure um, our impact from, from, from the, the issuers that we hold. And if we look at, I think, slide 29, I'm correct, um, we can, one more slide, sorry, slide 31. Fantastic, thank you, Michelle. Um, this is a great example, and I'll, I'll leave you with one, and, and we can obviously take more in, in Q&A, but um, this is, uh, you know, we, we, we think about materiality, additionality, and measurability. And, you know, every bond needs to stack up from, from that framework first, uh, as well as being compelling from a, a risk-adjusted basis, uh, from a spread basis versus, you know, the, the quality of the balance sheet of, of these issuers. And, you know, what this uh, particular issuer was is uh, a, a, a sanitation company that was building uh, clean water infrastructure in South America, uh, in Brazil, to, to be exact. Um, and so, you know, what, what this company was, was doing was effectively uh, providing uh, clean water to uh, large portions of the Brazilian population um, that didn't have access to clean water. Um, so they were effectively through their sanitation plants, uh, taking dirt, dirty water and filtering it into clean water. You know, this is a, a huge problem. And um, through the, the funding of, of their sanitation plants, uh, they were able to, to make a meaningful impact, um, but also allow us to earn a very healthy uh, spread and return on, on lending to, to this this infrastructure uh, provider. And you know, the, the key impact what we've measured from here is they were able to, to roughly um, provide 9 million people uh, clean drinking water. And, and that rep represents just under 5% uh, of the Brazilian population. Um, so you know, that's, that's one idea that, that we hold in the portfolio. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, we, we really look for impact opportunities uh, in, in a very wide remit across the world um, across those 11 different themes. And um, we, we do hold ourselves uh, very accountable uh, and, and measure the impact opportunities um, in, in, in all our engagements. And so, you know, with that, I might just close by, um, you know, sharing our, our track record and our performance, I think on uh, slide 57, if I'm correct. Um, and, and what you'll see from, from our performance, uh, one more, sorry, Michelle. Um, what you'll see from our, our performance is uh, that, now, over the history of the strategy, oh, thank you, you had it just over, over the history of the strategy, we've been able to outperform uh, in, in all market conditions um, over the, the, the short and, and longer term. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll hand back to our, our moderator, Jonathan. Uh, we, can, we can take some questions. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy and Michelle, and a warm welcome to all of you uh, who have joined us uh, for this session. Uh, we'll now break for this uh, Q and A session uh, in the uh, at the first half mark uh, of tonight's webinar. Uh, so the first question uh, has come in from uh, one of our investors. Um, he says, "Why has ESG become a key criterion now? Uh, is it investor driven, or is this government mandated? And are there are there any measures uh, to motivate or penalize?" Um, so maybe I could uh, direct this question uh, to everyone. Perhaps uh, starting with uh, Ting Yan. Thanks for the question. So um, whether this, why has ESG become a key criteria now? It's because arguably a little too late. I think people are finally acknowledging that this is a problem, especially in the, in the side of the environmental side, especially. People have been calling for some regulation on emissions for years and it has taken them really, really long for them to take any actionable sort of um, action on it right so because it is such a problem now and it's not government mandated it is also not investor driven but it is the fact that since most of the most of the governments are acknowledging that it is an issue they have ultimately have quite a lot of control over things like subsidies and um, tax breaks and this is how they encourage people to and these companies to innovate and to create solutions to problems. And this is, while this is not a mandate per se, this is how the government is um, encouraging 
investors as well as companies to expand into this space by helping them get started and help and giving them opportunities to innovate a little more. Okay, hey, thank you, Zian. Um, Michelle or Jeremy, would you like to chime in on this as well? Yeah, I guess we, we agree with Jin Yan. Uh, it's, it's really everything that's coming together. Um, uh, we do have, your, and COVID has acted as a, co uh, as a catalyst for, for the world to pay even more attention to you know, the, the social and environmental problems we, we have. Um, and so investors are becoming more and more aware that they can actually choose to invest their money uh, and gain some good return, but at the same time help build a better world. Um, so I think that's also one, one angle. But the government obviously have been putting a lot of efforts into you know, dealing with cl climate change. Uh, so that's another, uh, so in terms of environment within uh, ESG, so we've seen you know, by demonstration, we've talked about all that. Um, so all these are driving uh, as well. But one more thing is that on the private uh, sector, if you rewind, say, 10 years ago, you know, these problems, these social and environmental problem has existed for years and some forever, but they couldn't be de dealt with in a profitable way without the advancement of science and technology we have today. So that is, um, I believe, why it's getting more and more, you know, the, the, uh, the companies are getting more and more profitable. The runway for growth is wide because using technology, you can imagine there can be a lot of things that could be done in the future. Like you know, your smart meters already are helping uh, some of the European countries um, household saving water, for example. So these things will come out and eventually um, more and more of these impact companies make profit and become investable as well. One point I would just add to, to the conversation is I think if you look at different parts of the world, um, we're, we're on you know different um, uh, journeys when it comes to, to when it comes to to our, our view of sustainability, ESG integration, and, and impact investing. Um, so if we look at the likes of, of Europe and, and say Australia, you know they're further ahead along this path. And so you know I think what we're seeing over the last twelve to eighteen months is that. You know their um, you know views have really filtered into into the region and Asia, and uh, we've seen greater uh, appreciation. Uh, and, and and I do think you know as as, as COVID and, and Jing mentioned, um, you know COVID was, was a bit of a catalyst for people to to reset and think about their own values, their own philosophies, uh, and, and through that, um, with with the the, the increase in, in innovation, um, the pull forward in, in demand in a lot of areas, uh, we've been able to see that. Um, you know, impact investing doesn't have to be concessionary anymore. Um, you can make uh, you know reasonable returns as well as putting your capital to, to making a difference. Uh, and so I think that's really resonating with with end investors, uh, especially you know millennials and, and you know people who are thinking about uh, you know passing this planet on to uh, future generations. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, another question uh, for tonight is. With uh, these ESG exclusions, uh, will the investment opportunities be more limited and are investors uh, restricted uh, from accessing opportunities? Uh, perhaps I once again like to direct this question uh, to everyone here, perhaps starting with uh, Zikian. I think if you think about this for, uh, like a couple of years ago, not even that long, two, three years ago, I think you could say that it is very, very restrictive. But we are seeing um, a steady influx of new ideas both in the actively managed fund space and as well as the passively managed ETF space, there has been an almost exponential growth in the number of options available to um, investors nowadays. And while some of it, uh, they tend to cluster around certain, certain aspects, we are seeing more and more innovative ideas start to come up as well. I think COVID, I think we mentioned it plenty of times, COVID was a very important thing to highlight um, a lot of social is issues. And we are starting to see a lot more of this um, funds crop up with related, relating to healthcare accessibility, um, affordable housing and education. And I, would, I wouldn't say the opportunities are restrictive anymore, but if you came to me with this question a couple of years ago, maybe the answer would be yes. I think the other aspect to think about with exclusions and uh, the opportunity set is the level of the engagement an investor has 
uh, with its portfolio companies, uh, with its issuers, and really trying to um, understand, you know, what are these companies uh, doing uh, within their, their, their product life cycle, uh, within how they interact with their communities uh, from, from a reporting perspective, um, and, and really sort of engaging in and getting a better understanding. Um, because, you know, you may have companies that are, again, sort of earlier on this journey, uh, but are making leaps and bounds forward. And by, uh, you know, being a trillion dollar asset manager, we have a pretty impactful way of, of allocating capital and, and making a meaningful difference. Um, and so moving forward, you know, I, I do think it's, it, it's um, you know, highly probable that companies that um, are lacking uh, from that perspective and, and not taking into account all stakeholders are going to find it more difficult to attract capital at reasonable prices. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, by default, you know, whether it's applying ESG lens when choosing investments or you know, investing only in companies whose core product and services address the world's major social and environmental issues, it is screening down a broad universe of securities with some criteria, right? So, but we believe we're actually screening in companies with better potential, uh, growth potential, uh, uh, as, as Jeremy pointed out. Um, yet those companies are underrepresented by the major indices that we often see. And so there would be more market mispricing for us to capitalize uh, on as well. So applying these criteria, we actually think, yes, the, the universe will obviously be limited, but in any funds that you invest into, the whether it's just a you know, normal global equities portfolio, the portfolio manager will need to apply some sort of screening criteria to screen down the broad universe into something that uh, is 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 giving more growth uh, and, and at a better valuation. So there's nothing uh, different for this. And there is a large enough universe on the equity side. We have already ad identified nearly 500 stocks uh, that meets all three of our criteria. So I think that's not, we're not uh, finding ourselves limited. Right, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I'd just like to continue on uh, with, with another question. So the you mentioned earlier that the equity fund uh, seems to hold smaller cap companies. Uh, could this result uh, in more volatility? Good question. Um, it actually, so in terms of track record, we have almost, we're up uh, a five year anniversary in December this year. So if you look at our sharp ratio uh, on Morningstar, say for example, our sharp ratio is actually better than the MSCI All Country World Index. So not only did we generate alpha, but the risk level to generate that alpha is also not uh, uh, proportionally uh, uh, not higher. So I think th th there could be obviously volatilities because the fact that we invest more in small cap companies means that whenever market uh, has you know fight for safety, uh, like the first quarter this year, people will sell off small caps without really thinking about the fundamentals. So shorter term, there could be volatilities, but longer term, uh, we don't think investing in these companies is more risky, or we do not, certainly do not think that you would lose your capital because apart from uh, selecting those stocks with our three criteria that fulfills our impact uh, criteria, we also apply our standard investment process that the portfolio manager has been using for decades for all her different portfolios to pick stocks. So rigorous risk management, all those are necessary, but um, we do believe there could be obviously more volatilities due to the higher allocation to small mid caps and emerging markets. Right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and perhaps one more question uh, for Jeremy as we just round out uh, the first half of tonight's session. Uh, how will rising interest rates possibly affect uh, the impact bond fund? Yeah, it's a, a fair question, um, John. So when, when I think about rising interest rates, you know, we do hold interest rate risk uh, within this portfolio. Um, we're able to be overall underweight interest rate risk uh, relative to, to the broader uh, benchmark. Um, and so, you know, we, we do take that into mind when we're thinking about uh, credit and, and curve um, risks that we take within this portfolio. So, you know, currently we are underweight uh, interest rate risk relative to the benchmark. Um, the other aspect I think you want to take into consideration uh, is the, the, the credit risk. Um, so, so when you think about total return uh, in a fixed income portfolio, you know, part of your return comes from the, the credit risk you're taking, part of it comes from the interest rate risk we're taking. 
uh, and, and we are taking um, you know higher credit risk uh, in this portfolio than the, the traditional uh, index. You know, it's slightly higher, um, but we're getting a, a reasonable amount of, of increased uh, spread uh, for that risk, and so you know, that should sort of provide a little bit of cushion in a rising interest rate environment as well. All right, thank you, Jeremy. And uh, with that, we come to the conclusion uh, of the first half of tonight's session. Uh, right now, I'd like to hand over the time. Uh, to Darius, who will be joined by uh, Wing Kong from Nico Asset Management and Brian from the South Family Office. And they'll be having a fireside chat as to why sustainability and ESG uh, matters to investors. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Darius. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, Jonathan, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you, Darius. All right, thank you. Uh, if I may just ask and request that, uh, you know, you perhaps or uh, whoever is doing the slide sharing, they can uh, stop the slide share for a while, then we can proceed with the fireside chat. So a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're probably about 15 minutes in already. So thank you so much for joining us uh, and together on this FSM1 event. Um, my name is Darius and I'm from Nico Asset Management. I'm currently the Head of Intermediary Business Development Sales. And so today I'm very uh, happy to moderate this fireside chat. And I've got two very distinguished speakers that I want to introduce to you right now. Um, on the screen, you should be able to see a gentleman called Brian Gold. So Brian, if you can help me to just give a wave to everyone or not, thank you, Brian. Uh, so Brian is actually the CEO, CIO. So he's got two roles, CEO and CIO at the Tsao family office. So he's going to be, you know, sharing some ideas and some tips, you know, with, uh, from the perspective of an investor tonight. Now, on the other hand, I have uh, Chu Wing Kuang, who is our own Nico Asset Management Portfolio Solutions Group. Hi, Wing Kong. Thanks for that little wave. Um, so he is going to be talking to you about, you know, this impact investing from a asset allocator perspective. So maybe, you know, not to steal um, Jonathan's thunder and all that, uh, but we're going to do a very important announcement later on. Uh, but just to share with you, you know, in terms of the framework, Nico Asset Management, we are creating this product called the Impact Investing Multi-Asset Fund. And essentially, if you are investing into our fund, we will hold two of the Wellington funds that you've heard about earlier on. So the Wellington uh, Impact Fund, as well as the Impact Bond Fund. Now, Wing Kuang will be the one that's, you know, um, basically doing the asset allocation between equities and bonds. So a little bit more about the fund features and the fund uh, info itself. Uh, right now, I just want to bring us into a more intimate discussion with regards to the whole idea about impact investing. So I want to address my first question, you know, to both Brian as well as Wing Kong. Now, obviously, I've just, uh, you know, introduced that Brian, you're representing a family office and Wing Kong, you're representing the role of an asset allocator. Now, perhaps from both your respective roles, could you perhaps share with the audience what your thoughts are in terms of defining impact investing and how does impact investing or what does it actually mean to both of you? So maybe I want to invite Brian to go first. Uh, certainly, thank you. Um, first of all, um, the Tsao family office uh, invests uh, with an ESG and an impact mandate. It's our mandate. It's what we do. Um, and within that, um, we, we look at impact and ESG in, in several different ways. Um, it's a complex and complicated subject. Um, but we basically have three buckets uh, of budgets out of which we allocate. Um, in one, uh, we focus um, mainly or uh, entirely on the impact. And in that bucket, we are happy to take concessionary returns. In other words, if we get our capital back, um, we're happy. We're not so concerned about the returns. Uh, in the next bucket, we, we want to earn a market return. And um, I believe we're able to get a superior, a market plus return while pursuing impact and ESG. And finally, we have uh, the ESG bucket where ESG is used as a risk mitigant. Um, and uh, I think we also get a superior risk adjusted return because ESG is becoming more and more important in mitigating risks. And there are all kinds of uh, risk. Um, on the climate front, it's very clear to see. Um, 
it's impacting agriculture, it's impacting shelter, it's going to cause a certain level of inflation that's persistent and not transitory. Uh, so we better invest in a way that prepares for that. Um, I think what's of interest to uh, most people is how we can invest with impact and make a market plus return. Um, it's an aspiration. Uh, I think when we look across um, not just Wellington, but uh, competing uh, or peer products and strategies, uh, impact has outperformed. Brian, so. Brian, can I get you to just hold that thought for a moment? Because mm -hmm. that's actually a second question that I want to direct specifically at you in a short while. Right. But just before yeah. I hand over to Wing Kwong, um, you know, I just want to interject with this question from the audience. Obviously, you know, ESG, sustainable is a buzzword right now. But I know because of our working relationship, uh, it is not obviously the last three years, five years. Perhaps you can just share very quickly how long has South Family Office had this as your mandate? Uh, full disclosure, I joined the Tao Family Office about three years ago. Um, but the Tao family have been practicing sustainable and responsible investing for a very long time. Uh, longer than 15 years is, uh, is what I know. Now, before that, I don't have the history, but they've always had this uh, philosophy of doing well and doing good at the same time. Uh, I myself personally, um, I approach impact and ESG from an academic angle, from the point of view of economic rigor, and completeness of information sets. And there was a marriage of minds, which is why I, uh, um, we, we came together and I'm managing their, their philanthropic capital. Right, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, very interesting. I'm definitely gonna revisit that point later on. So I just wanna pass it to Wing Kwong right now. Wing, uh, as a asset allocator, you know, looking at you know, whether to overweight equities, overweight bonds, I mean, how does impact you know, investing weigh in on your thoughts as an investor? Um, thank you very much, Darius. I mean, to us, impact investing is about being good stewards of capital. Being good steward of capital entrusted to us by our investors and being good steward of capital, then being good steward of our natural environment, the physical world and the communities that we live in. This impact fund um, seeks really to, deal, to achieve both objectives, um, like what our friends at Wellington say, deliver double bottom line. The first is you'll hear us talking about this very often. We want to do well for investors by delivering good long-term returns. And Brian has called that market plus. The second is really do good to the world by enriching life essentials, supporting human empowerment, and addressing environment, environmental challenges we, collect, we collectively face. And the important point to note is that both objectives are complementary to each other in the medium to long term. And the circular pursuit of sustainability is presenting structural trends and surfacing many good investment opportunities in both credits and stocks, as our friends and we have been telling us. Okay, thanks, Wing. Um, at this juncture, I want to invite uh, the audience as well to participate. I know many of the questions were more investment related, uh, specific to the Wellington team, which please be assured, we will reach out to them and get some answers from them uh, and come back to all of you. But specifically, if you have any investor thought, you know, your concerns, your queries, I think Wing and Brian are the best people to really pose the questions to right now. So Brian, coming back to you earlier on, and I think uh, you talked about it as Market Plus, Wing talked about it, you know, as the double bottom line as stated by himself and Wellington. So perhaps you can share with us from your perspective, um, obviously, you know, from the days of SRI investing to ESG down the line right now, there's always been a bit of a misnomer to people or investors that, well, if I'm trying to do good, I, I kind of lose out a little bit on the returns. And you touched on a little bit just now before I interjected. So perhaps you can give your thoughts on, um, you know, do you really lose out uh, from an investment perspective? even more so during this current environment where sustainability is really the concern of everybody's hearts and minds, yeah. Uh, yes, I think if you pursue uh, impact and, and ESG, um, the first thing you're doing is you're mitigating risks. And, and these are risks that are now front and center, climate, like I said before, and on the social front, a very interesting test case is China. 
Um, the interventions by the Chinese government can be construed as uh, a power grab, but I don't think so. When you look at what they're doing, they're not um, regulating everything. They're supporting some sectors and they're regulating others. Um, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to avoid the social ills uh, that plague um, capitalism today. Um, it's, they're not, uh, I think, pursuing a communist agenda, but a capitalist one that addresses um, a social uh, equity, a, a social equality agenda. Um, if, you, if you had that in mind, you would have avoided some of the sectors, the monopolies, for example, the rent-seeking uh, sectors, and those um, that uh, uh, um, where there are negative externalities. Um, so it's, it's a very good tool for risk mitigation. Um, but further than that, if you're pursuing impact, you're always looking for solutions to not just today's problems, but tomorrow's problems. And when you do that, it's not just a risk mitigant anymore, but it's a uh, an business opportunity origination um, tool, a very powerful one because it's, it's forward looking. So I think on on those two bases, um, we hope and and believe that we can get a, a higher return in, in the long run. Now, to be clear, that you know there are seventeen uh, UN SDGs. Not all of them uh, will give you a market plus return. There are certain problems in the world that can only be solved by uh, government and regulation, and the market's not going to be able to solve it, and investors are not going to be able to solve it. Um, in fact, in, in certain areas, it is consumers who will solve these problems better than investors. But imagine if we, investors, didn't do this, didn't fulfill this role, then um, it, the situation would be even worse. Thanks, Brian. I think uh, while you talked a lot about the capitalism of it, I, I, I'm sure there are many parents probably on this call who do wish that some form of regulation on the social front will come um, barring children from playing more than three hours of computer games and all that. <laughs> but that's obviously not, uh, not, not from an investor perspective. So, uh, Wing Kong, we heard from Brian. I, I just want to change tracks a little bit and um, also talk about from your perspective, right, how does asset allocating because obviously Nico AM are doing this as a multi-asset fund. Yes. So we're not just looking at impact, we're, we're managing a little bit on the whole equities versus fixed income. And uh, I just want to couple this together with some of the questions that I've seen yes. in the chat as well. For example, um, someone was asking, you know, given that there was some South African water sanitation plan mm -hmm. um, that obviously is government linked and may not be able to pay, you know, as attractive an income. So literally, because, you know, if you're buying into the Wellington uh, bond fund, you know, on its own, um, whoever's asking this question, you're absolutely right. You may not be looking at clipping very high coupons. So I want to introduce uh, Wing to basically, you know, talk a little bit about how he's trying to add value to all of you as investors from doing some asset allocation. Yeah, Wing, over to yeah, you. Think, um, it will really come from two perspectives. The first is to ask the, the, the ultimate return objective is a total return based one. So granted that there are to be specific instances whereby the income will not come through um, from underlying assets. But if you think about the total return of the portfolio, things can be more fungible, whether it is getting returns from total return, uh, capital gains, or income distribution. So there's a lever with which Nico will play by, um, by, by making sure that um, there's a good balance between capital allocation, uh, capital gains as, as well as the payment from an asset allocation perspective. And the other, the other way we look at asset allocations is also, um, there were one question, there were one question asked about the small cap tilt of the equity portfolio. There's also another question asked about interest rate sensitivity of the bond portfolio. At, at, the, end, at the end of the day, we all recognize that because this is a long in the portfolio, there will be a lot of, there will be a very sizable market risk embedded within the entire fund. Um, granted, our friends in Wellington will be managing it from the idiosyncratic perspective, um, but there's also a purpose that Nicole can come in to help to manage the more broader market-based risk versus interest rate risk or whether it's a small cap risk, depending on where we are at the part of the market cycle. And then if we are going to put all these things, um, I'm going to reflect our, our all these 
uh, this risk management techniques um, through the asset location that Nico AM will be playing in the management of this fund. Thanks, Wing. Um, obviously, not to put you on the spot then, but uh, you know, as a multi-asset manager, you know, um, if I may summarize what you're trying to say is that you know you almost will be managing it sort of like an absolute return stuff, yes. right? You know, and yet we're trying to pay a bit of an income, right? So while uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, past performance is not indicative of <laughs> performance, so and so forth. Uh, please read your prospectus and all that. I just want uh, Wing to also just share, uh, you know, what, what is your rough expectations? I mean, when we're talking about the income, because uh, you and I, we both know as we're crafting this product, we want some kind of income stability, right? So can you share with the clients? And obviously I'll jump in a little bit. Yeah, as well. yeah. so we're, we're thinking more like, 3.5 or more percent in terms mm. of income distribution. That is really a function of the underlying compass through how the fund is performing and also the opportunities that we are seeing in the fund. Yeah, thanks, Wing. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've, you've heard it as well. I mean, with managing this fund, uh, we want to be utmost transparent that whatever allocation, obviously on the equity side, they are not you know, huge dividend paymasters. Uh, we will be clipping some coupons from the fixed income side of things, but it is really up to Wing and his team to manage the fund such that you get absolute return and you know you are able to enjoy you know at least you know what we are targeting a three and a half to four percent kind of a dividend kind of a payout uh and obviously you know we have wing and uh in fact uh, brian who's obviously uh, going to be a very significant cornerstone investor into our fund um you know essentially saying to you look when we're not trying to take your monies clip a coupon to you and then you see NAV take a nose dive, right? So we're definitely there to preserve value for you. And, you know, this is also one of the reasons, um, I think there was a question that says, you know, why take a multi-asset approach? Because we do believe in doing good, doing well on both sides of the equity, uh, the, the equity and bonds, asset allocation side of things. Um, but we also want to, you know, turn this into a bit more of an outcome driven uh, product, which is, you know, we, we are impact investing, we are giving you a good, you know, uh, steady dividend return and as well as a total return basis. All right. Um, Brian, I want to just swing it back to you as well, because I just shared a little bit, I let slip that obviously it's our family office in your philanthropic goal and all that. You are also going to be a very important cornerstone investor within our fund itself. Um, so, you know, would you have any other thoughts as a cornerstone investor, because obviously um, with a lot of our audiences today, uh, sustainability, you know, uh, asset legacy planning for their future generation is something that will weigh very strongly on your hearts. But given that, you know, again, you guys have been doing it for a while, what are your, you know, thoughts to um, share with them and perhaps even give them some experience, you know, from what you guys have been doing? Um, that's a very big question. <laughs> Uh, as I said, I have a dual mandate. Um, I, I have um, I have to make money to fund the the grants and distributions uh, for the philanthropic activities of the Tao family, and uh, also we've got to make sure that we're not, um, on the one hand, undoing the good that we're doing on the other. <laughs> so we're responsible investors, um, and. Uh, you know, over and above all that, right? Over and above the mandate, I think, uh, you know, personally, I, I feel that there is a need uh, for investors to, to do something. All of us have to do something as consumers, as investors. Uh, it's important because um, I, th I think we've, as, as a species, we've lost our way a little bit um, and damaged the environment. I, I don't think we, we're not there, you know, um, intentionally to damage it, but through neglect and negligence, it's happened. And now we have to fix it, and it's pretty urgent. Uh, on the social front as well, uh, social justice, I think, has been subordinated to uh, outright profit. Um, and I think it's time that um, we, we address some of it and, and try to fix it. And I think that in fixing it, we will actually improve growth. I'll give you an example. If on a budget neutral basis, I tax, I, I have a higher tax and I make distributions to lower income households. Um, so on, on a net zero fiscal basis, I'm going to increase growth simply because I'm taking money away from someone who's not going to spend it as quickly. And I'm going to direct it to a household that will spend almost all of the money that we give them. 
And what does that do? It increases the velocity of money and it increases GDP growth. Now, this is uh, nothing to do with um, the morality of it or anything. If I was an engineer trying to speed up growth, this is one of the easiest ways to do it, is to equalize the, the wealth and the income across the economy. So it's kind of um, funny that uh, you have the confluence or the alignment of these two objectives that, you know, by trying to grow at all costs, we've created great inequality. And yet, by creating more, in, more equality, we can increase growth. So there are many examples of this. And that's where I think uh, the greatest financial and, and uh, social impact uh, will be done. Thanks, Brian. I, I, I find, mm -hmm. and even as you're saying that, I mean, uh, um, you know, I find myself again gravitating to some of the issues in China right now, especially with the tuition centers and all that. Um, yeah, everyone was hyping about them because they were making extraordinary profits, right? But they were really only earning from the rich. I mean, if there is a cap, if you make education affordable, just exactly like what you say, more people can afford to, you know, um, um, embark on those services like tuition and all that. And yes, there will be more consumptions. There might be even a greater need because when you're serving the top 1% of China versus the top 15, 20, 30%, you just also generate more jobs and all that. Am I right to kind of like use this as an analogy of what you're saying as well? It is a, it's, it's a good example, yes. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, Wing, I want to swing back to you a little bit as well, because I think earlier on when we talked about asset allocation, um, I think we didn't quite um, 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 highlight to the clients as well that, you know, when we are creating this multi-asset product, it's not going to be a 50-50 mix. Yeah, so I, I think this is important um, to let them know because, again, um, for members of the audience out there, you know, you might be very familiar with some of those multi-asset products which has a fixed weightage. And then once it skews a little bit, it rebalance. Wing, I want you to talk about what you're going to do, how you're able to do it. Yeah. So the, with this fund, you can expect the equity and bond allocations to be between 40% equities to 60%. All the way to 60% equities, and of course, the will be 60 40 for fixed income. So, we do intend to make asset allocation shift uh, depending on how we see the macro market. And we do have an asset allocation framework within Equestria and management and my team that we will be using to guide us in making this mid to long term asset allocation shift. Right, Wing. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously now going to play a bit of a devil's advocate and stand on the side of the, you know, of the consumer or the investor tonight. Um, so what sort of assurances, you know, are you giving us that, you know, you're not going to take the lazy approach, if I may, <laughs> on that 50-50 or uh, I'm just 52-48, yeah. Um, perhaps maybe you can use this as an opportunity to uh, highlight that as a backdrop of the macro environment today and how you're likely going to be even playing your portfolio in the next few months. Sure. So, I mean, that, that relates back to how we view the market. Um, um, longer term, my team is bullish equities. So when we are bullish equities, you can, you can, you can expect the equity allocation to be 56 to 60%. But at the current, we're actually quite cautious on the next few months, as we try to, as the market gains more clarity on the growth situations in the US and China, as the COVID situation plays out. So we will tend to be more cautious these few months. So we won't be able, we won't, if there's not intention to bring equity up to 50, 56, 60%. You're more likely to be, um, depending on how the situation plays out, you're more likely to be high 40s. To low 50s at the moment, but it is not a reflection of a benchmark hugging behavior of us. It's really a reflection of where we see the market is in the short term. As well. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Wing, for that clarification. So, I guess, um, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, I guess the real reason I'm also asking this question is I want to give you that assurance that yes, we're not hugging a benchmark. There is going to be some kind of a dynamic allocation and a real thought process behind our allocations as well. Um, so Wing, I just want to pull mm. this question coming in from Evelyn Chiam. Um, mm. She was asking, you know, what then in the light of, you know, this recent, maybe last, uh, she didn't give me a time frame, but I'm just going to say, uh, you know, in light of past performance, so maybe the last one year, the last three years, 
Um, looking at what has happened, I think largely it's going to be tainted because of COVID-19. Yes. <laughs> but what's your kind of thoughts about, you know, performance on the absolute return basis on the one year, three year, you know, performance as well? Um, Brian, after Wing, maybe you can also uh, chime in from a CIO perspective, mm -hmm. you know, when you're looking at the family office as well, mm -hmm. what are you expecting uh, returns to be like? If you can add on mm -hmm. some color to that. Wing, you first? I've learned that it's very dangerous to look at the crystal ball and try to put a number. <laughs> but if you are talking about 12, 12 men and out, um, one, one year and out, the critical period will be, for me, to be the next few months as market gets clarity on interest rate policy, on where the COVID is going and the, the expected economic slowdown. So we definitely will not guide investors to 15, 20%, 25%, like what I've seen in the last 12 months. But getting a decent return that will be able to help us to deliver on the, on the 3, 3 4% dividend payout should be okay. Right. So, but I really hesitate to point a number because I've, I've, I've seen how the market can always prove us wrong. But, right. <laughs> yeah, but we, we do, we are do hopeful in the long term uh, of delivering good market plus return especially opening the winter. Yeah. Thanks, Sing. Uh, um, just a side joke to all the investors. Uh, I borrowed Wing's crystal ball, so he can't use it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ryan, over to you. Uh, would you happen to have a spare crystal ball around? <laughs> uh, no crystal ball, but um, you know, wearing my hat as an investment person. Uh, okay. If you want to invest, you should invest over the long term. But everyone tells you that and the reason they do is because it's true. If you're trying to make money over a one-year time frame, um, then you have to trade, and trading is expensive and difficult to do. Very few professionals can do it. Um, and if you're not full-time, um, your chances of success are even lower. We invest for at least a five-year horizon. Actually, we invest for a 10-year horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and over that kind of horizon, uh, a lot of the challenges that we face today will pass. Mm -hmm. What we're betting on over those timeframes are innovation, human ability, human ingenuity, that we will overcome uh, obstacles, that we will find solutions to our problems. And when we find solutions, we get paid for providing those solutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a long-term um, target return of floating rates plus 5%. Um, and in order for me to write a check to any product, the expected return from that product must be higher because not all products and not all investments work. So I have to make some allowances for things that don't work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that gives you a sense of, of you know, how we think about the returns and, and so on. It's a difficult environment today. Uh, Things are very expensive, yes. interest rates are very low, but all this will pass in time. It's very difficult to time these markets mm -hmm. and things don't always repeat themselves. Those yeah. people who navigated 2008 really, really well, come 2020, didn't navigate it so well, mm -hmm. even though the markets initially looked very similar. Yeah. Um, so how we invest is uh, you back uh, good companies, good businesses, and um, you back responsible people because the fund doesn't just fund uh, businesses, it funds households as well in the RMBS and uh, in mortgage backed securities and, and securitized credit. Uh, and if we invest in uh, responsible ways with responsible stewards, with responsible um, business management and responsible households, you get a good outcome in the long run. Right, thanks so much for that, Brian. Uh, I'm just gonna use that as a, as a bit of a compliment as well that, you know, obviously as a cornerstone investor to our fund and backing us in Wellington, uh, that we have checked your box in, <laughs> in the so-called criteria that you just mentioned. 
<laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, uh, just one, uh, I think in the interest of time, we could probably go for one or two more questions. So again, um, thank you so much for that question, Rebecca, about the three, uh, I mean, the leading indicators. So um, just very quickly from both gentlemen, uh, while we've talked about, you know, in the last answer, we've talked largely about the time frame, the philosophy and all. Um, Rebecca is just asking, you know, do you have three main leading indicators that you look at when, in general, when you're looking to support equity allocation. So uh, Wing, obviously this question was first um, um, posted to you as part of your management of the multi-asset product. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting to hear as well if the, the answers are congruent together with what uh, Brian as a you know, CIO is also looking at. So maybe Wing, you first, what are the three leading indicators? Yeah. So for, for my team, we, are most, we approach investing from a very fundamental um, manner. The way we look at it is that we look at longer term trend, uh, clearly, the longer term trend to us is towards one of lower yielding interest rate environment where the world is hung up, has too much debt and not attractive demographics. But at the same time, technology advancement is really creating a lot of exponential trends. And many of that that we use to help us deliver the returns and in, provide impact solutions to this fund. Um, so one, term that, one thing that we always look for is where we are, how the longer term trend is playing out. But within the medium term trend, we also look at medium term trend, especially spending a lot of time looking at business cycles, the credit cycles. So right now, what we are seeing is that um, the economy is probably getting as good as you can get. Uh, there's a lot of demand pull forward. And right now we are seeing um, economy reporting slow down, slow patches. So what I'm trying to, I'm using two, these two examples to say that the way we approach asset allocation is a combination of where we see long-term trends to be, especially interest rate trends, as well as analyzing business cycles and credit cycles to give us, the, to allow us to better position for medium to long-term, mm -hmm. uh, to better position the restaking of the portfolio in the medium to long-term. Right, thanks Wing. So, so not to put you on the spot, so one is trends, you know, mega Algorithm trends, trends two, and business cycles. Yeah. Two business cycles. So what would be a third? <laughs> um, the third is difficult. Because if you, if you see how, I, how we look at it, we, we tend to look at long term, then we try to understand the short to medium term. Right. So maybe what I can say is that uh, in the, in the, because those are the slightly longer term trends, but the third thing that you probably look at is, you know, thesis risk, for example, right? Uh, so that's your short term risk mitigation. Kind of an example yeah. but we, we tend not to trade that much in the short term yeah. the objective yeah. is not really for us to be going in and out of the yeah. fund and what ryan has said in terms of lot trading costs cost. but at the same time i don't think we have that kind of crystal ball to know how the market will do in the next one two months of course of course that's not, that's also not our, the, the 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 objective of our asset allocation um yeah. But, but i guess some of the short-term risk could sometimes lead to the erosion of the long-term story right Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Wing. Okay, Brian, over to you. Three, three leading indicators. Uh, I, 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 I can't give you leading indicators or any indicators. What I can tell you is uh, that I invest in long-term themes and sometimes I'm in too early and sometimes a little bit late. But if it's a long-term theme, you can afford to be both mm -hmm. too early and too late. If you're trying to catch something with a very short cycle, you can't afford to be wrong by very much. Um, what I have to say about uh, ESG and impact is that it's going to attract a lot of capital. It's also going to attract, uh, on the other side, um, a lot of policy mm. uh, because it's an urgent need and it's, it's the survival of, of the species, basically. Um, so let me, let me, um, put up one idea, which is if you don't care about the environment and you don't care about social justice, right? You should invest in ESG and impact because there will be a flood of capital coming ahead of it. Mm. And it's, it's going to be a multi-decade theme. So you can afford to get it, the timing wrong um, because it's such a long-term theme. We're not going to fix the climate in three years or five years. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take 20 years at least to get the first results and 30, 40 years before things actually get better, yeah. materially better. The same thing on the social justice side, 
um, there will be, uh, I think, a lot of turbulence. And um, the more enlightened countries and governments will try to get ahead of that. And if we invest ahead of them by supporting social justice and uh, um, you know, fair practices and uh, supporting communities, then we're getting uh, in early on the theme. Right. Thanks, Brian. I think that's a very uh, eloquent way and a very, uh, you know, rounded manner of talking and addressing ESG. Uh, perhaps in my own a bit more colloquial manner, I, I would say, yes, jump ahead of the trend, right? So 30 years ago, if I could go back in time in the Michael J. Fox time machine, I would have asked my grandfather to open a coffee shop. And today I might be a tauke of, you know, some coffee and toast chain. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, you heard it as well. If you want to be slightly ahead of the curve, uh, you can't bet anything wrongly, so to speak, you know, if you're looking at ESG per se. Brian, I just want to throw one last question of the night to you. And I think um, if I'm not getting, I mean, the person didn't leave his name, but if I didn't get the general or, or the gist of this question wrong. Basically, he is asking as an investor, how do you allocate monies in this current climate? I mean, would you, you know, put it all in at once or are you going to do a drip and drag over the next one to two years? I suspect the genesis is because most people would have made the quick money on the tax and all these others over the last one, two years. But the real problem is if I'm taking profits from there, what am I going to do, right, with the money? So I sit on it, wait for the next crash, but we've all been waiting for the next crash for two over years. So I think this question, uh, it's directly, uh, you know, addressed to you. So perhaps you can share some thoughts as well as a, you know, investor. What would you do? Uh, yes. First of all, um, the, the, the Tao Family Office portfolio is, is always invested. So there is not this concept, but... Uh, so if you talk from a, a personal or individual investor's perspective, um, you should always be invested. That's one thing. Uh, don't lose your position. Uh, one of the, the sins in investing is getting out uh, too early and then not getting back in because the market runs ahead. Um, if you are all cashed up and you haven't invested a cent yet, now that's different. What you should do is average your, your purchase price. Uh, mm -hmm. And don't try and time it. Decide beforehand. Decide before you look at charts, before you look at uh, the past. Decide that you're going to invest a certain amount every month or every quarter yeah. and then stick to it because short term, on a month-to-month -month basis, you don't know where the market's going to go. Nobody does. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Thank you so much, Wing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that although you're at home, uh, you please join me and uh, give a big round of applause to Brian and Wing Pong as well. Now, um, just to sum up, I know there are a lot of questions on the Q&A. Um, a lot of them are asking, you know, very specific targeted questions uh, with regards to the Wellington um, um, implementation within their portfolio itself. So I didn't answer those questions because uh, Wing and uh, Brian were the wrong people to answer. But please be rest assured, you know, we will, um, uh, after this call, um, speak to Wellington to get some answers back, um, you know, uh, uh, with regards to this. Now, I just wanted to take one last question, though, from uh, um, so-called um, Terrence, if I'm not, uh, not Terrence, sorry. I think there was one question that was essentially asking about, you know, how can, you know, both uh, Brian and Wing Huang as, you know, asset allocators looking at investments and all, um, you know, be assured of what the fund managers say that they will be doing. So I think I'm going to just answer this on behalf of them. So members of the audience, I think you can be very rest assured because um, prior to, you know, investing into our fund, uh, Brian and the Tao family office has also been directly invested into the Wellington strategies as well. So undoubtedly, they would have done their due diligence on those funds. Um, Wing Kong and his team, um, he's not just a one-man team or three-man team. He's got 13 people under him. And as part of their due diligence process, they have also, you know, due diligence the, the Wellington Fund as well. So it may sound a little bit condescending that we're due diligencing our, our peer group, but I just want to give you that, uh, you know, that assurance that, you know, in this whole working relationship, um, there are quite a fair bit of checks and balances, you know, when we're trying to piece out this product together. 
Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, this has um, been an insightful time for you with regards to what impact is. I hope that you understand, you know, the journey of SRI into ESG, into the measurability of impact investing. Um, and, you know, with that, I just want to end on a slightly more lighthearted note this Thursday evening. You know, I hope, you know, like this little pot, uh, you don't see anything in it at the moment, but I hope you give it a bit of thought. You plant that seed of, uh, you know, sustainability and impact and all that. And like what Brian says, over the long period of time, you actually get a bit rewarded, you know, with a, a good performance as well as what both gentlemen says, do good and do well. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this uh, fireside chat. I'm going to hand the time back to Jonathan and company at the FSM1 team. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Wing Kong. Right. Thank you, Darius, as well. Uh, and also to uh, Tingyan, Michelle and Jeremy uh, earlier for really sharing with us and bringing to light uh, all these important uh, opportunities. Uh, thank you also to our clients for your attention and participation today. I uh, hope the session has been beneficial for you and learning about the ESG theme. Now, for those of you who are keen to find out more about the Nico AM Impact Investing Multi-Asset Fund, uh, you can head over to our homepage on fsm1.com to read more about it, or you can also click on the link, uh, which I will drop into the chat function shortly. Uh, so to usher in the launch of this new fund, in which IFAS and fsm1.com are proud to be the exclusive distributors of, we're also offering a bonus units promotion for a limited time for all our valued investors. Uh, the details can also be found within this article. So that's all we have for uh, this evening. Uh, stay tuned to fsm1.com as we continue to bring you more investment ideas and opportunities. And I'd like to wish uh, all of our valued clients here tonight good health, as well as all the success in your investing journey. Thank you and good night. <laughs>